chapter, I'm sorry, <laughs> seminary under the leadership of Professor Lynn Sweet. Her experience in church ministry includes senior pastor, youth and children's pastor, praise and worship leader, ministry organizer, teacher trainer. She has completed a Proclaimer's Place Seminar at Baylor University. In addition to that, she is a product of the Heights, as well as being a product of Mount Sinai Baptist Church. Um, Jamel Bledsoe uh, also often informs us that she is her namesake. <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> okay, Seneca Jamel, that's right. Okay, girl, you got two. That's right. Okay, good deal. <laughs> with, with me growing up in the Heights area, they were just known as the Matthews, okay? Six siblings, Jamel is the fifth of six siblings, a very well-known family in our community, a family of gospel singers, beautiful anointed voices. The six of them would sing together and you would be so blessed to hear them. And when you're, if you're lucky enough, every once in a while, you'll still get to hear a small group of them coming together. So we're in good hands tonight and I'm so happy to introduce her and so happy that I know her and grew up with her and we're just in for a treat. So uh, you're in the very capable hands now of Dr. Jamel Kemp. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. And I am a product of seventh and a half street in the Heights. Amen, somebody. <laughs> I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the head of my life to the Mountain Church, to your pastor, my good friend, Pastor Sam Gilbert II, and to Lady um, Gilbert, Sister Gilbert, you know, I have such great love for you and I'm praying for the family and the home going of our sage, uh, Samuel Jackson Gilbert Sr., who taught me everything I know about Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I remember vacation Bible school to John, Deacon John, thank you for the invite and to Kathy for the introduction. All that you read just says two things. I know Jesus and I'm trying to tell somebody about him. That's all it says. So tonight we want to jump in and I've been given this topic for this relationship seminar conference titled, What's Love Have to Do With? And I applaud your efforts to stay grammatically correct, but we all know this is Tina Turner. What's love got to do with it, right? We all know that. And so what I want to do now is we're going to pray and we're going to ask God's blessing on this presentation that wherever you are in a relationship, coming out of a relationship, thinking about a relationship that God would minister and give you something that you can hold on to as you traverse and go forward. Amen. So let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you, first of all, for your love. It is never ending and never failing. We thank you for your faithfulness because you are faithful to a thousand generations. So Lord, as we look at this topic on tonight, as we hear from you, Lord God, I realize it's a buffet and everybody's not going to take what's served, but whatever they may stand in need of, God, I ask that you would amplify it and that you would put it deep down into their hearts so that they can see only you and serve you as we try to do this thing called life. We give your name, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what I want to do is share my screen, if I may. And let's see if you all can see what I see. Do you all see what I see? Can somebody give me a thumbs up? Do you see a screen? All right, here we go. All right, what's love have to do with it? That's what we want to know. Anybody want to know the answer to that? <laughs> when we think about relationships, we have to echo the words of our sister, Tina Turner. What's love got to do with it? I'm not playing the whole song. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about it. So when we talk about relationships, one of the things that we need to pay attention to is this. 
I love you in a relationship means I see you, means I see you. If I love you, I see who you are, I know who you are, and I see you. And we can, I don't know what's happening there with this scribble on there, but we're going to move on. The question that I have for us tonight, and it comes from a book, um, and I'm going to share that book at the end, but the author's last name is Sofer. He asked this question, can we see each other as autonomous individuals with our hopes, our dreams, our fears, and our joys, and our sorrows? When you see me, do you only see the part of me that you want to see? Or do you see all of me when we're in a relationship? That is so important because all of us come with all that we are in that relationship, or at least we should. Now, I have been married for over 30 years, but I remember the beginning of the relationship. It all starts out like this. I like popcorn, you like popcorn? And so we both like popcorn, right? And then it starts out with, I like basketball. Okay, I like basketball too. And then as you grow, you realize you really weren't being true to who you were because you didn't truly bring all that you are into that relationship. It's so important that you are first true to yourself. Now, I do want to add this. If you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat because I do want to address questions um, at the end of the presentation, if I may. All right. So the next thing is this. There is a traditional Zulu greeting that says, Sawubona. Sawubona, which means we see you. And your reply is Yabo Sawbona. Yes, we see you too. And the acknowledgement is this that it becomes an agreement that we have an invitation to participate in each other's lives. When we go through life, have you ever thought about, I want you to think about this, how many people have you met throughout your life? As Sister Kathy was talking about, we've known each other since we were children. I want you to think back to 8th Avenue. I want you to think back to Love Elementary School and Reagan High School and wherever your life took you. How many people did you really see? How many people really saw you? Were you open to being who you truly were, your authentic self, so that we could really see you? You know, it reminds me of the story that Jesus, when he was walking and he saw the short man in the tree, he said, Zacchaeus, come down because I'm going to stay at your house tonight. He had to see him in order to call him down, right? So we want to think about in relationships, we see you. Now, because I am an ordained gospel preacher, I got a scripture to go with this lesson. And the first scripture that we're talking about tonight is Colossians 3 verses 12 through 14. And we're gonna end with the love story, which is in 1 Corinthians 13. Excuse me, Dr. Kemp. Yes. Oh, there's a screen in front of your presentation. I guess that's your, your building. If you could just hit cancel on that so that everyone can see what's behind it. Okay, if let you... me see if I can get there. Where is it now? It's directly in front of your presentation. Um, I guess this is where you started the building where you would build your presentation. It has minimal on there. I don't know if you see that wide 16. I don't see nine. that. Let me see if I can exit out because okay. I do not see that. Yes. If somebody can give me some guidance. Um, so it's it, on from our view, it's directly in the middle of the screen. We see mm -hmm. your presentation behind it. Hold on. There. Okay. That's okay. better. That's now perfect. what do you see? Now we see the presentation. But do you also we, see the uh, slides? Yeah, we see slides? the slides on the side. So you will need to just go straight to document in the upper right-hand corner so that we could just, um, there it says uh, format, animate, document. And well, it's, it's right-hand corner from my side. So it's probably left on your okay, side. Okay, so I'm on a Mac. Does that make, okay, yeah. document. Yeah, I'm very familiar with Mac. If you could Okay, just thank you. So go to document here. Thank you, thank you. Okay, I see it, I see it, document. Okay, we need to go to the slides. And then go to play? Yeah. There you go. Are we oh, cooking with Crisco now? It's still popping up this, um, yeah. 
this in the middle of the screen. You may have to do it from just this version. Okay, and that's um, fine. We'll roll like that. Thank okay. you so much. You're welcome, no problem. Okay, so let's go back. We talked about saying I love you means I see you. We talked about this Zulu greeting, we see you. Yes, we see you too. And now we're gonna take a look at the scripture because we need to know what does love look like for the children of God? It's more than just Sunday morning hallelujahs and shouting. When we talk about the love that the children of God have, we look at this scripture where Paul was writing to the church at Colossae, and he says, so chosen by God, this is the message Bible, for this new life of love, dress in a wardrobe God picked out for your compassion, kindness, humility, quiet strength, and discipline. Be even tempered, content with second place, and quick to forgive an offense. Forgive as quickly and completely as the master forgave you. And regardless of what else you put on, wear love. It is your basic all-purpose garment. Never be without it. Think about that. All of the things that we hear in this scripture are wrapped up in love. So even when we're being kind, we've got to use the mechanism or the avenue of love. If we're showing humility, it must come out of love. It's so important because the Bible records Jesus's words to the disciples. He says, they'll know you're my disciples by what? Your love one for another. Now, in order for me to love my neighbor, I have to first what? Love myself. I have to love myself. I have to know that I am beautifully and wonderfully made. I have to know that when God made me, he made me because he loved me. And if I can love myself, then I can love my neighbor. We got to take a hint from the airline industry. You've got to put that mask on yourself first, right? Before you can help somebody else. We're going to look at three big questions that we deal with when thinking about being in a relationship. And I want you to think about these three questions. Are you ready for a relationship? Are you ready to participate in the most basic communication skill? And we're going to talk about what that is. And then are you ready to live through love going back to that Colossians uh, scripture? So here it is. We want to know if you're relationship ready. And if you look in the parentheses, it says in and on a. What that means, are you ready to be naked and unashamed? When you're in a relationship, you are naked and unashamed. You are coming into this thing totally with who you are. So one of the things that I think about when I think about relationships, when you're dating, that's your fancy self, that's your polished self. But once you get married and you've been married for a minute, uh-huh, that's the real self, right? <laughs> They see everything that you have to put on to make yourself presentable. It's so interesting how I remember growing up. <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you which one, but one of my sisters says, oh, my God, you ain't in front of your boyfriend. I'm like, you don't. And so you go into a marriage with this man thinking you don't eat a lot. And then you get married and he's like, wait a minute. <laughs> Why? Are, that's not the same person. You've got to be naked and unashamed. Girl, if you eat a three piece, go ahead and order the three piece, okay? Because you've got to bring everything that you are, everything. You've got to be open. You've got to be vulnerable. And that's difficult because when we're in a relationship, I'm trusting that when I give you who I am, that you're not going to harm me. That's a trust that is built in relationship. Now, notice I haven't really kind of um, identified between marriage or dating or anything like that because all of these concepts can fall under marriage, can fall under dating. These can also fall under sibling relationships and even friendships. 
the way you can have lasting friendships over life is to be open. And how many of us have been hurt by friends? Why? Because we were vulnerable, but we were honest about who we were. And then how many of us have chosen to end friendships because we kind of felt they were too honest. We didn't hear what, we didn't want to hear what they had to say. But the next thing I want to talk about is being present. We live in a fast paced world. We think that we're multitasking, but we're really not. It's so important that we slow down and are present in the conversation, present in the moment. You've heard the comedian say um, the joke where he talks about um, his mom and dad were married a long time and how did they stay married? And the dad says, because I just answer your mama with mm-hmm. And so she would always ask him questions while he was watching football. And his answer was always, mm-hmm. And every time she had something for him to do, he just said, mm-hmm, until it was something he didn't want to do. And then he paid attention. He was now present in that moment. But when you're in a relationship, it's so important that you are present in every aspect of that relationship. And then you want to be dependent and dependable. Now, I don't mean dependent to the point where you can't uh, be your own person, but the person needs to know that they can depend on you. And you need to know that you can depend on that person because you're in that relationship, okay? All right. And let's talk about communication. You see where I have in parentheses, y'all, I've been trying to do these hashtags, so check it out. It says, this is not the dreaded, W-N-T-T. -T. Does anybody know what that stands for, W-N-T-T? -T? You know what it is. We need to talk. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that, especially in a relationship. Because when one of the individuals says, um, we need to talk, that usually means someone is in trouble. But we're not talking about that communication. When we're talking about communication in a relationship, it is choosing when and how to speak. The Bible talks about how a soft answer can turn away wrath, right? Even when you're angry, you can choose when and how to speak. The major thing with speaking is you want to be heard. And so when we make the right decision on when and how to speak, it helps us get to a place where we can be heard. Has anybody ever walked out of a relationship or even an argument or a conversation and you felt like that person didn't even hear me? I'm pouring my heart out and you didn't even hear me. And the reason why a lot of people don't hear in relationships is because of the second thing. We need to choose when and how to listen. Listen attentively to what I'm saying. Now, when we talk about listening, and I'm so guilty of this, I'm really working on intentionally working on this. When someone is speaking to me, I have to focus not on what I'm going to say when they finish, I have to focus on what are they saying to me. Too many times when we're having conversations, we're not listening, we're waiting on our turn to tell you what we think. That's not communication because you are so set up, ready to say what you have to say that you're not hearing what you're partner is saying, what your spouse is saying, what your friend is saying. So it is so important that we communicate. And then I want us to do this thing that many of us are uncomfortable with, and that is the power of the pause. Embrace the pause. Embrace the silence. If I were to stop talking for 15 seconds, many of you would think that there's something wrong with my internet or there's something wrong with the computer because we don't like that silence. That silence makes us uncomfortable. It makes us think that something is wrong. But sometimes if we embrace the pause in communication in relationships, 
we could solve a lot of problems. We could eliminate a lot of arguments. We could change the dynamics of conversations. Could you imagine what life was like before stoplights? That's a pause. Could you imagine how many things could be turned around in our world today if people would just take a minute? It can change, oh, it can make a world of difference. But also how we pause is important. It goes back to the listening thing. When you pause, are you just waiting to pounce? <laughs> when you pause, are you really in the conversation and thinking about how I can stay connected to this person, how I can stay connected in this relationship. The goal is for us to get to the end together. The Bible says, how can two walk together unless they agree, right? But sometimes it's taking a minute and just pausing to see what they're saying and what I want to say. <clears throat> and so let's get all of this together, the pause, the communication, the listening, and let's talk about this word right here, <clears throat> love. So what does love have to do with it? What is love? Can anybody give me quickly? What do you think love is? Okay, so what I want you to do is look at this picture. What you see is the ocean. You see the horizon, you see the clouds, and it looks like it goes on forever. What it is. This picture is demonstrating for us what love is. It is an everlasting gift and it's for everyone. Love is for everyone. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Love is not particular to age or stage in life. Whether you are married, whether you're divorced, you still have the love of God at your disposal, at your uh, uh, side to walk with you through life. Whether we go through ups and downs in life, love is available for us. It's an everlasting gift. And this is what love does. I love this picture because what you see is a brick wall and then you see a vine. The truth of this vine is it's on the other side of the brick wall, but that's what love does. It overcomes obstacles. It overcomes things that would try to stop it. When you think about how much love we have for God and how much God loves us, Nothing can separate us from the love of God, right? Nothing stops God from loving us. It doesn't matter how much we've messed up over and over again. This vine for me represents that God's love will reach us no matter where we are, no matter what we have done. And that ought to make somebody say amen. Because when I think about my life, and all the things that God has had to forgive me for, I'm grateful that his love reaches over walls. I'm grateful that he doesn't cast me out. The scripture says, does God keep a record of sin? No, because who could stand under it? I'm glad that his love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power has no boundary known unto man. God's love is like this vine that's going to find a way to get to me no matter what is coming my way. Now, if that's the relationship that I have with the father, surely that's the relationship I want to have with my brothers and sisters, with my spouse, with my sibling, with my friend. But what does it cost? Love costs something. It costs the sacrifice of the son of God. It cost Jesus giving his life. When we 
think about Calvary's cross. It was love that held him there on the cross. Do you know that if you were the only person on earth, he still would have gone to the cross for me and you? If we were the only ones, his love was going to go to the cross. And so I want to end with this. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 13. It's very familiar. It is the love scripture. But what I want you to think about this, God is love. So saith the scripture, right? So if the scripture says God is love, then everywhere I see the word love in this scripture, I can put the word God. Because God is love, the writer of this chapter of 1 Corinthians says, if I speak with tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So it doesn't matter how many letters you have behind your name. It doesn't matter how many achievements you have made if you do not love. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not love, I am nothing. I don't care if you are a miracle worker. If you don't love, you are nothing. So saith the scripture. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. So even if you give all your stuff away, but you don't love, you get nothing, right? Love is this, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast. So as we're reading this scripture, I want you to think about your relationships. I want you to think about who you are in relationship with, with your spouse, are you patient? With your spouse, are you kind? With your friends, do you envy? With your siblings, are you boasting? Are you proud? It says here, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. Y'all know that's kind of hard in today's society because we all got what? Instagrams and we all got Facebook. It's all about me, 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 look at me. But that's not love. Love is not self Seeking, it's not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrongs. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand if you got a grudge against somebody from 10 years ago, but I know we do that. I know we do that every time we see them. Mm -hmm. You remember, I, it was 20 years ago, girl, when, listen, that's not love. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always, check this out, always protects, always trusts, always hopes. All of those things, look at that word, it always. That's how you know that love is God and God is love because he is the one who what? Always protects, always trusts, always hopes and perseveres. But that same love of God is within us. And then it says, love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. And where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. That just means we don't know everything. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, the author says, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became full grown, I put away the childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Remember, love says, I see you. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I am fully known. That's what love is. Love is God fully knowing who you are. Do you know that God knows the you that you don't even know? I'm talking about the you you don't want to face. God knows who you are and you are fully known. And it says, now these three remain. Faith, because it's impossible to please God without believing that he is. Hope, Jesus is our eternal hope 
and love. But the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these is love. So I want you to know when we're talking about relationships, what's love got to do with it? Everything. What love has to do with relationships is everything. A relationship that is not built on the foundation of love is doomed from the beginning. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Do you know it is God working in you to love him and to show that love to one another? Y'all want to know what's going to make the world good better? It's a song that came out in the 70s. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Oh, that's the only thing that there's just what? too little love. And if we, God's children, would learn how to love one another. Kathy, I don't need you holding a grudge against me from 30 years ago because I sat on the road you were going to sit on. Listen, that is not love. We've got to love one another. We've got to learn to forgive. I want everybody to put your hands together like this. Put your hands together like this. And I want you to think about somebody that you had a grudge against. You might have a grudge against them right now. I want you to think about somebody who has offended you and you have every right to be mad. But this is what I want you to do. I want you to be Jesus right now. And I want you to let them off the hook. Now who's set free? You just got set free. You let them off the hook, but now you're not tense about it anymore. Now you can speak to them. Now I'm not saying go back in dangerous situations when somebody has harmed you, but give it to Jesus. He says, vengeance is mine, said the Lord, I'll repay. You don't have to get somebody back. Hey, let them off the hook. Let God be God and every man alive. Let him do what he promised to do. And he promised that we'd have tribulations. He said in this world we would, but he also said, but be of good courage because I've overcome the world. You want to know what love has to do with it? Everything. You cannot have a successful relationship without love. And I know everybody in this Zoom meeting, everybody on Facebook is thinking about that song we all sang as a youth choir. You know it. There is no greater love, right? <laughs> When Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me, that's love. Oh, yes, it is. They hung him high and stretched him wide. He hung his head and for me, he died. He took my place. That's love. Listen, greater love has no man than this, than a man would lay down his life for his friend. Jesus called us friend before we even knew who he was. It says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Y'all know that's love, right? When somebody prepares something for you, that's love. And he has prepared the sacrifice. God prepared Jesus to be a sacrifice way before the beginning of time. Why? Because that's love. I'm going to end right there, Deacon John, but I'm going to ask this question one more time. What's love got to do with it? Everything. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you, Dr. Jamea Kemp. You have blessed us. I mean, you have really blessed us. Love is an everlasting gift. Sometimes you got to put a pause on it. Um, just sometimes you got to recognize love overcomes obstacles. I mean, we were blessed. Thank you for really being biblically sound and uh, giving us great sound doctrine. We appreciate that. And uh, I'm looking at my time. I got time for one question or comment. If uh, anyone want to give a question or comment, uh, please do so now. Unmute yourself. And uh, if you have a question, comment, a question to Dr. Kemp, uh, you can do that at this moment. Or uh, comment. Hi, I would like to say great job to my namesake, Dr. Jamel Kemp. Hey, Jamel. Praise the Lord. Hey, Hello. I'm so blessed. Every time I come into your presence and I love the way you speak about the Lord and your love for him is so infectious. And I can relate to you when you said that you have issues sometimes focusing on what people are saying. And that's me too. So I don't know if it's because we're both Jamels, but <laughs> that's something I'm going to work on too. So 
Praise the Lord for you and your spirit. I love you so much. Love you too, Jamel. Thank you. I will say well done, but I'm very biased. <clears throat> That's my husband, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, honey. <laughs> That's awesome. Wonderful job, cousin. Wonderful job. Amen. Thanks, Pook. <laughs> Wonderful job, Reverend Kim. God bless you, Sister Jan. Thank you for blessing me, colleague. So good Amen. to hear you. And your other so Amen. good to see you. Yes, God good bless to you. See you, Kim. Anyone else? I'll take one or two more. Hey, John. <clears throat> yes. Melba. Hey, I knew I knew Dr. Jamel could sing, <laughs> but I didn't know she could deliver. Uh, <laughs> At this level, I thoroughly enjoy it. Amen. God bless you. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Sister you. Brooks here. Uh, Deacon John, I just want to tell Sister Kemp, uh, Mr. Kemp, that we should already know that love, everything, Everything has to do with love. Right. And you can't live without it. That's right. You surely can't walk without it. Mm -hmm. Because the God that gave his son for us made it possible for us to be able to love ourselves. And Amen. for that, I just want to tell her thank you. But that was beautiful. Thank you, Jamea. Amen. God bless you, Sister. Bring the word. Great job, Jamel. Appreciate you. God bless you. Hey. This is Ann. I see you, Ann Pettis. God bless you, ma'am. Thank you for tuning in. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. And thank you again, Dr. Kim, for blessing us. Uh, we're getting ready to go higher. It is, again, my privilege to be able to uh, present our pastor, the one who was, has allowed all of this to be able to take place. And uh, really just trying to be a blessing to the kingdom. As you know, we have not had any registration uh, for this conference. It does not mean that there is no cost. Uh, someone will say more about that a little later on, but it's because of the generosity of our pastor that just really want the people to get the information. And uh, we're so blessed uh, to be uh, able to be under, under the leadership of our own Reverend Dr. S.J. Gilbert II, and he will come and take us higher in his way. Amen, glory to God, glory to God. We are just delighted of what the Lord is doing right now in this season and blessing us with this BHR of Building Health and Relationship Retreat. Uh, thank you, Deacon John, and thank you, John, and thank you, Jordan, and uh, Jordan and uh, Sister Gilbert, uh, for all of that you all do to help making building health relationship uh, special, not only in the life of the Mountain Church, but in the life of all believers who are willing to come and share with us. And we welcome all who are tuning in today. And let me just say, to uh, Reverend Dr. Jamel Kemp, uh, someone at the Mountain Church, you know, we grew up together in Tiny Top Choir and all that nature in the hikes. And, and uh, uh, Dr. Kemp, uh, we have a saying in Houston Met that when you preach instead of lecturing, you cross the line. So you got real close to that line today. <laughs> Yeah, that's a Houston Met joke there. You know, we always tell our folk that when you when you when you um, own to do some other than preaching, but you get close to that preaching line, you got close to the line. Uh, you kicked a lot of dirt on that line today, Dr. Kim. Right, we heard a lot of preaching in you today, and we were blessed. Let me just say this first of all. We were blessed by uh, your presentation of what love got to do with it. It's always important to know that for any relationship to happen appropriately, the first relationship has to be with understanding what the love of God is all about. You cannot truly understand how to love anyone unless you truly understand what the love, grace, mercy, and peace of God is really all about. And thank you, Dr. Kim, for for breaking that up for us and helping us understand the details as it relates to what love has to do with it. 
uh, with uh, understanding communication, power, pause, three big questions that's asked, and also uh, uh, what does what does it cost? And love always has a cost, believe it or not. And uh, uh, love says, "I see you," and uh, we just thank you so much for that. Amen. All right. So now. Uh, let me do what I've been asked to do, and that is to introduce and present, I guess I'm on to introduce and present two people, uh, two wonderful people of God. Uh, first, I didn't want to say a word about my good friend, Reverend Terry Brown. Now, Reverend Brown, because he's born the oldest of two pastoring sons to Joseph and Gloria Brown, Terry Lavelle Brown Sr. is a native of Houston, Texas. He's been married to the lovely Carol Annette since April 11, 1992, and they are the proud parents of Terry Lavelle II and Carrie Alexandra Brown. Pastor Brown has been a Christian since the age of 22, despite having grown up in church since birth. His most dominant pastoral influence are his late grandfather and first pastor, the Reverend Joseph Brown Sr., his father and the minister, the late Dr. A. Lewis Patterson Jr., and his bishop, Dr. James W. E. Dixon II. Pastor Brown graduated from Texas Southern University of Houston, Texas, and attended Dallas Theological Seminary after moving to Los Angeles, California. He completed the past in the Mount Community Development Institute of the University of Southern California. He's currently pursuing his master's degree at Biola University's Taba School of Theology. He serves on the board of directors of Imagine LA, a nonprofit organization involved with providing wraparound services for formerly homeless families in the LA area. And all of us know how serious the homeless situation is there in LA. Pastor Brown has been honored to be the preacher, speaker of many churches, revivals, and colleges around the country. He serves as Dean of Ministers Conference in the Los Angeles District Association, as well as Vice President of Christian Education of Baptist Ministers. And he served as pastor of his childhood church, the Pure Light Baptist Church in Houston, Texas from 97 to 2004. He served as pastor of the Liberty Baptist Church of Los Angeles, California since October 2004. Moved by the Holy Spirit, his friend and mentor, Dr. John V. Baylor, appointed him to serve as the fourth pastor of Judson Baptist Church of Carson on April 3rd, 2020, making Pastor Brown the pastor of two churches. The move of God has expanded his message and ministry across Southern California. He served both Liberty and the Judson Churches. Now, he is a classmate of mine. He goes way back with me. We knew each other before. We, we accepted the call of God to preach the gospel ministry uh, back when we were in middle school. I think that's about where we started. So our friendship spans uh, the test of time. And I just thank God for Pastor Brown and his scholarship and his gift of love for the causes of Calvary. But I thank him for his friendship all these years. Some people, you know, you never know um, when you meet people in middle school at an early age before you start preaching uh, that later on in your life that you'll still be uh, friends, not only friends, but in the same area of ministry, pastors and preachers, and neither one of us at that time knew that we'll be doing anything like we're doing right now. But I thank God for his friendship that has uh, expanded and uh, have endured the test, the test of time. I also want to present and introduce to us <clears throat> Cheryl Wesley. She is, she is uh, the wife of a good friend of mine who's gone on to be with the Lord for this tent uh, about a year or two ago. I shared at the homeborn service there, but her husband, uh, just to say, 
um, uh, mentored me in college at Bishop College. Uh, he was already graduate. He was a, a graduate of Bishop, and um, I decided pledge A Phi A. And uh, I thought I could make it. Me, OC Junior, and uh, some others. We thought we could make it because we didn't see but two alphas on the campus at the time. And uh, uh, so we thought we could make it, but little did we know that once we got online, that half a Dallas would converge on Bishop College campus <laughs> and who had already graduated from Bishop and had pledged Alpha and they all came to the campus to pledge us. And uh, her husband, uh, pulled me out, made me one of his special. I had to make sure that uh, at that time it was his girlfriend, fiance, you know, her car was clean and washed and all that kind of thing. He made us do all kind of, kind of stuff to make sure that they relate to us. So I have something to do with them getting together. Amen. <laughs> but uh, we thank God for uh, uh, Cheryl Wesley the Antioch Baptist Church there in Dallas, Texas. She is a, um, a lifetime member of Alpha Kappa Alpha uh, Sorority Incorporated. She serves as chaplain there. She's a volunteer, um, serves as director of community services, missions, and outreach for the Antioch Fellowship Baptist Church uh, in Dallas there, where her eldest son, uh, Chris Wesley is the senior pastor. She, Cheryl, is humbled by the grace of God that has covered her life. She's been afforded many opportunities to proclaim Jesus as Lord and especially passionate about challenging the culture and encouraging women with the truth of God's word concerning them. And her greatest joy in the earth is the family God gifted her with. She was the wife of 34 years, my friend and brother, Dr. Kerry D. Wesley, who was the founding pastor of Antioch Fellowship Church, who moved from labor to reward on November 13, 2019. She is great, the grateful mother of sons Chris, Carl, and Charles, and the delighted mama, Mima, to grandchildren, Kevin, Carter, Kareen, and Malaya. God be the glory for the things he has done. There's more to come, but he is not finished. God has so much to do through the life of Cheryl Wesley. We want to welcome both of these beautiful, wonderful personalities of God to the Mountain Church and to the Houston community who's viewing in today. Let's pray that God anoints each of them in their presentation in uh, the Mountain Church 2021 Building Health Relationship Retreat this year. We certainly welcome them and we're delighted they chose to come and be a part of our wonderful fellowship today. Let's hear what they have to say. Let's receive first, Reverend Terry Brown. He's All muted. Right. There we go. I just, yeah. Uh, good after, well, I suppose it's good evening uh, in Houston right now. It's, uh, it's a little over 4.30 here in LA. Uh, and uh, I'm excited. Uh, let me say right quickly, uh, uh, Dr. Jamel Kemp, you did a phenomenal job. Thank you for, uh, for sharing with us what love is and uh, the reality that it is. Uh, it has everything to do with it. To my friend and my classmate of, uh, as he said, he said middle school, which means he he's lost his grip on reality. We went to junior high school. Uh, it wasn't called middle school then, uh, but that goes to show you he he may be aging just a bit more than I am. Uh, but uh, we have been longtime friends, I suppose, over forty-five years now. 
And uh, uh, Pastor Gilbert is uh, just a, a joy. He's a, a blessing to the body of Christ. Of course, you can't really help it when you come from a Dr. S.J. Gilbert Sr. and, and Mother Alice uh, Gilbert, uh, who I had the pleasure of speaking to even today. Uh, but uh, you are a brother beloved, and uh, I appreciate all that God has done in you, through you, uh, and even for you. Uh, thank you to uh, John Gilbert, Deacon John Gilbert, for uh, reaching out and allowing me to participate in such a necessary uh, ministry, such a necessary forum. Uh, this is a subject uh, matter that uh, we don't deal with enough. And uh, I think we have seen and are seeing uh, the consequences uh, of not having dealt with it, uh, perhaps as we should. Uh, but be that as it may, uh, I, I uh, certainly uh, appreciate all who are participating, all who are viewing and all who have uh, spoken uh, yesterday and today. And uh, uh, without any any further ado, I'll just get right into it. I did post uh, uh, a copy or a link rather uh, of my presentation, so anyone who wants to can download it, and uh, it'll be right there in the chat. Uh, let me just have a word of prayer uh, uh, as it relates to this specific uh, topic, Father. In Jesus' name, we bless you and thank you for the privilege, opportunity, and responsibility to uh, to just say. Uh, a word uh, about marriage. Uh, we honor you and we glorify you for we understand that marriage is your idea. And, uh, and because it's your idea, uh, you have given us the wherewithal to do it and to do it well uh, as we lean on uh, your divine guidance. Uh, we thank you for the phenomenal examples that we have seen in, uh, in the Gilbert uh, family and uh, Lord, we just wanna give you glory for what you have done and what you are going to do during this season today. Uh, you get all the glory. Give us the joy of bringing that glory to your name for it's in the great name of Jesus that we pray, amen, amen. Um, my assignment uh, is to speak on the topic, let's stay together. Of course, I immediately uh, with my, with my uh, sometimes carnal mind, uh, went right into that Al Green song and uh, started just humming that and, you know, singing it and, and popping my fingers to it. Uh, but uh, I think that subject, uh, that topic says far more uh, than just a sweet song. It is, um, it is uh, a commitment, it is a pursuit, uh, it is a reality that uh, I think uh, ought to be on the top on the list of every person who gets married. Uh, and so uh, I just kind of want to speak to uh, some of the issues and, uh, and hopefully give some, some practical uh, principles on, on this subject. Now, I, I must give, give a disclaimer. Uh, I've only been married 29 years. And so I am by no means an expert uh, in this field. It is only by God's grace and mercy uh, that uh, my wife has tolerated and put up with me for for lo these almost 30 years. Um, and uh, in the words of, of that old song that we sing in the, in the black church, I don't feel no ways tired. Uh, but uh, I uh, admittedly, uh, am a, am a, this, is, this is an experiment with me and, uh, and uh, by God's grace, he has taken us and is taking us uh, through these years. And uh, I, I just pray that uh, our relationship, our marriage, uh, will be a blessing uh, to others, even with imperfections. Let's stay together. Uh, here are some statistics on divorce. And I thought it would be helpful to kind of, before talking about how to stay together, to uh, just find out uh, just kind of where we are as a, as a nation. Uh, and unfortunately, even as a church, as it relates to uh, divorce. Uh, divorce and recovery will be something today's pastors will deal with much more than our predecessors. Uh, according to the 2000 census, so this is a bit dated, uh, for some US ethnic populations, single parent households outnumber homes with, married, with a married couple family. Uh, research by the Barna Group shows that 35% of married people endure a divorce and 18% of divorced people are divorced multiple 
times. Uh, multiple divorces are extraordinarily common among born again Christians. 23% are divorced two or more times. I must admit right here that uh, I was, I'm a product of, uh, of, of a broken home, of a divorced uh, family. My, my mother and my father married each other three, married and divorced each other three times. And so uh, I know what, I know what growing up in a family where there is a father who was in the home and then suddenly out of the home and in my case back in the house and then out of the house and all of that. Um, almost half, that is 46% from the baby boomer generation, which happens to be my generation, have undergone a marital split and millions more are expected to divorce in the next 10 years, which would be a right about well, that was 10 years ago. So uh, as for younger generations, they are likely to reach similar uh, numbers. It's estimated that somewhere between 40 and 50% of marriages that begin this year will end in divorce. Those are, those are startling statistics. Um, what are leading, leading causes of divorce? Uh, the Austin Institute for the Study of Family and Culture using data from 4,000 divorced adults identified the top reasons for divorce as to why people break up in the United States to include infidelity by either party, spouse unresponsive to needs, incompatibility, whatever that means, immaturity, I know what that means, emotional abuse, and then financial problems. There is no question that the rate and pace of divorces are among the highest in American history. The damage done to the divorcees themselves, their children, their finances, and most of all, to the body of Christ is immeasurable. Almost any child raised in a broken home, as I suggested earlier, will tell you that something was missing when their parent left the home. So here is a question. Is there a remedy for keeping us together in thriving, healthy, and prosperous relationships? Can he, that is God, help us stay together? Well, the answer to, this, to these questions is absolutely yes. However, there are some key truths and realities that we must come to grips with first. I hope you're ready. Truth number one, marriage is about God and not you. <laughs> I wish I could hear an audience member say amen or something. I'm, I'm, I guess everybody's on mute, uh, but y'all I'm a Baptist preacher and I, I just, uh, but let's, let's move on. Amen. Marriage, there you, thank you. Marriage is about God. It is not about you. Uh, I went into marriage believing that it was all about me and my wife. And to be sure, there is a, a, uh, there is a reality that, that God uses. God, uh, God brings people together. Sometimes uh, it is obvious the hand, obviously the hand of God. Sometimes it is our own hands. But in either case, once submitted to God, uh, God has given us the capacity to have a fruitful and prosperous marriage. According to Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, uh, Paul says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. 
he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does, does the church. So, uh, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and, and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So then what is marriage? Marriage is the expression and example of Christ's tremendous love for his glorious church. Marriage was created by God to be a lifelong and exclusive covenant of love and dedication leading to children and family if possible between one man and one woman. In marriage, people's commitment to each other comes out of God's commitment to us. I wanna say that again. Peoples, that is mere humans, our commitments to each other comes out of the reality of God's commitment to us. God has promised to love us, protect us, cherish us, and care for us forever. And that is a covenant that cannot be broken. Likewise, God has empowered husbands and wives to love, protect, cherish, and care for each other until death. And that is a covenant that should not be broken. Notice God's covenant with us cannot be broken. Our covenant with one another should not be broken. Next, covenant is the invisible foundation that makes long-term marriage possible. It is the secret to, an unlock, to unlocking the mystery of oneness and the delight of fulfillment. The essence of covenant marriage is that two people become one. Covenant demands the death of two wills and then the birth of one. I becomes we, never to be separated again. The Bible says they are no longer two, but one flesh, according to Matthew 19, 6. That is basic covenant. The Hebrew word for being united or joined together means to cleave, cling, or stick. The corresponding Greek word means to be glued together. Covenant marriage partners permanently bound, bonded will not come unglued when trials and pressures come against the marriage. Now, again, coming from a what, what, what society calls a broken home, um, and <laughs> if you were to ask either of my parents, why did you get divorced? Um, they would, I'm sure, have different perspectives. Well, she did this, or he did that, or she didn't do this right, or he did that wrong, because everybody has their own personal perspective as to why a thing did not or does not work. What is interesting to me, and we'll find this truth kind of pronounced in the next section, um, is that God loves his spouse unconditionally. John 3, 16, of course, says, for God so loved the world. And the word world there has the idea of humanity. But it's humanity that is at that point unregenerated. And so uh, when God so loved the world, he loved sinners, people who were already disconnected from him, people who were uh, always walking opposite of his will. And yet he loves them unconditionally. But not only does he love his spouse unconditionally, he forgives his spouse totally. God forgives his spouse. Jesus said while hanging on that cross, Father, forgive them 
for they know not what they are doing. Listen, the key to any marriage working are basically two words, forgiveness and grace, because we are mere humans. We are fallible, we are frail, we are fickle, finite, we fail. And, and, and then not only are we all of that, but then God connects us to another individual who is fickle and frail and finite and all those other things I just mentioned. So you got two imperfect people coming together and left to our own devices, left to our own perspectives, our own whatever, uh, there is sure failure in that scenario. But God yet tells us and basically commands us that we are to be married until death do us part. Well, clearly we don't have the wherewithal in and of ourselves to make that happen. But whatever God calls us to, he empowers us to do. So he loves his spouse unconditionally, according to John three sixteen. he forgives his spouse totally. And then he perfects his spouse gradually. According to Ephesians chapter five, verses 26 through 27, uh, uh, Paul talks about the fact that Christ uh, does some things for his bride in order to perfect her. And it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in an instant moment. But over time, as we yield to the spirit of God, Jesus Christ begins to work on us and ultimately, he works on us so much so that he will present us spotless. <laughs> he works on us so much that we become more like him the more we walk with him. And so he perfects us gradually. Now, if that's what Christ does for the church, how much the more ought we, must we, should we do that for our spouses? It, it, it's amazing to me how I got married and expected perfection from my wife. How my wife got married, and I'm pretty sure she knew there was no perfection in me. And yet it, re it was required of both of us to give each other the room and the rope to grow, to develop, to be forgiven, to be, uh, to be loved unconditionally. And all of that takes place even in a scenario where an imperfect person is connected to another imperfect person. I'd like to ask everybody on the Zoom right now, um, when did you discover that you were an imperfect spouse? Or have you yet discovered, <laughs> have you found out yet that you are an imperfect spouse? Because the reality is, is that, is that God knew from eternity past that he was going to be putting two imperfect people together. And yet he commands and demands that we stay together. Even when we give legitimate reasons, even when there are legitimate reasons for a divorce, you know, biblically speaking, uh, divorces can only happen because of abandonment uh, or adultery. Um, and, and, uh, and those are reasons that, you know, uh, divorces are granted. But even though they are legitimate reasons, we still don't have to divorce even if those things exist. Because God forgives us totally. Anybody there? Amen. Amen. Truth number two. Marriage is about serving your spouse, not you. Marriage is about serving your spouse and not you. You may or may not be served or get served, or you may not be served uh, the way you want to be served. 
But the reality is, is that this truth suggests that marriage is about my service to my wife, regardless of her service towards me. According to Ephesians 5, 22 through, 20, uh, through 33, Christ makes the greatest sacrifices. Um, uh, if you would look at Ephesians 22, once again, I want you to see something. In Ephesians 22, I mean, Ephesians 5, 22, And in verse 25, I believe, yeah, the Bible says, husbands love your wives as or just like Christ loved the church. And what did he do? Gave himself for her. Christ made the greatest sacrifice for his church without the church ever sacrificing for him. But his love for her made her made him to make the greatest sacrifice. Of course, that sacrifice is the work that he did on a hill called Calvary. But then not only does Christ make the greatest sacrifices, Christ renders the greatest service. Notice when verse 26 of chapter five, it says that he might sanctify her. That is, that he might set her apart, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. So, so it was Christ who made the sacrifice for his bride, and it was Christ who made, who rendered the greatest service towards the bride. And nowhere do we find that the bride sacrificed or made or rendered service to him. The point being is that once I am married, I have a commitment, I have a responsibility to serve my spouse, whether my spouse serves me or not. Now, to be sure, um, you know, none of us are Christ, and none of us are self-contained as Christ is. Uh, but the reality is, is that he gives us the capacity to do what he has given us the command to do. So if Christ sacrificed for his bride and served his bride and he's perfect, then how much the more should my imperfect self do the same for my bride? Thirdly there, uh, Christ makes the greatest sacrifices, Christ renders the greatest service, but consequently Christ reaps the greatest reward. Notice in verse 27, it says, so that, he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. What do we learn here? We learn that Jesus Christ saw his bride, saw that she was imperfect, saw that she didn't have it together. She was sinful. She was messed up because I'm speaking of us as the church. And even with all of that, he sacrificed for her, he served her, and consequently, he is now going to reap the benefits by having a bride without spot or wrinkle. Uh, one of the things that we don't like to do in many cases is we don't want to put in the work to help our spouse become all that God has created them to be. Uh, we, we want them to come. Uh, already packaged in perfection. We, we want them to already, when we marry them, to have it all together. And so they've got to be a great lover. They've got to be a, a great parent. They've got to be a great helpmate. We want them to have it all together. And the reality is, is none of us has it all together. All of us are missing some links. All of us are missing, uh, uh, you know, some of what we need in order to be all that God has called us to be. But that's why God gave us the Holy Spirit to help work out of us and work into us in order to uh, conform us to the image of Jesus Christ.
So while he instructs, while Christ instructs the husband to practice these same steps, there is an implied sentiment for the wife as well. In other words, her role, while it is to respect her husband and all that, uh, but she is not devoid of the responsibilities that he just illustrated for the husband to do. So it's required of her to sacrifice for her spouse. It's required of her to serve her spouse. And consequently, she will reap the benefits, you know, of the husband she ultimately wants. Somebody once wisely said that, that while we as married people often look across the fence and we see greener grass over there, the truth be told, if we would water our own grass properly, we'd have some green grass on our side. So we must understand that marriage is about serving my spouse, even if and or when I'm not being served or not being served the way I want to be served. Truth number three, marriage is about God's glory, not merely my happiness. Mm. Somebody might be saying, I wish I had known that before I got, before I got married. Yeah, it's about God's glory and not merely my happiness. To have a marriage that stays together, we must be clear on God's plan. Our happiness, while it's important, it has a place, is not preeminent. Our joy, however, can only be realized as we participate with him to fulfill his purpose. So there are three things that that we learn from the book of Genesis that, that God had intended or has intended for us as it relates to marriage. Number one, he has intended for us to be partners to do the work of God. Um, look at Genesis chapter two, verse 15. Genesis two, 15. And the Bible says, the Lord God took the man, that is, you know, took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Notice that God has given man an assignment. He's given man a job. And his job is to work the, uh, the garden and keep the garden. That's his only job at that time. And then in verse 16, it says, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, uh, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So now immediately after that, he says in verse 18, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So now why is God giving this man a helper? Because God knows that the man needed a partner to help him do God's work. Secondly, he knew that God, that man needed a partner to obey God's word. God says, after he put the man in the garden and gave him the job, then he says, I'm putting it, there's this tree in the garden and, uh, and you can eat of every other tree and all the fruit you want, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat because in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Somebody has often said, you know, why would God put man in that position? Why would God, why would God, you know, even put man in a place of temptation. And, and I've discovered that you never really know where you stand on anything until you have to make a choice. And so, you know, the vows we take say, uh, forsaking all others, I'm clinging to you, my spouse. Because, because God is a God, he's a God of free will. He's given us a free will, but he also has given us parameters to exercise that free will. And when we exercise within the parameters that God has set, 
then we will experience the joy. We will experience the harmony. We will experience the blessings from God. But when we decide that what God said is not, um, is not sufficient, is not, is not adequate to satisfy me, and we go outside of that, then we find ourselves in disastrous situations. So, so God gives us a partner to do his work. That's our purpose. He gives us a partner to obey his word. That's our priority. And he gives us a partner to influence the world. That's our potential. In Genesis chapter one, verse 28, turn that right quick. It, the Bible says, and God blessed them, that is Adam and Eve, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in it, with, with, with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food and to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food and it was so. And God said, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And so what God does for, the, for man and his wife is he, he empowers them to influence the world for the glory of God. So when we think about marriage, it is more than just somebody that makes me happy. It is more than just somebody who satisfies my needs. It is more than just uh, me having a soulmate or whatever else we want to call it. Marriage is about God's glory and not necessarily about my happiness. Finally, at some point, a lasting marriage must settle on some non-negotiable convictions. These convictions are the glue to the covenant that we make with the one, with the one that is God who established the insti in, uh, institution of marriage in the first place. Here are what some values that, some things that we ought to agree upon. Number one, agree on common values. Number one, our marriage is to honor Jesus Christ. Number two, our marriage is to honor one another. Secondly, agree on common views. Number one, to love unconditionally. Number two, to forgive unlimitedly. And then number three, agree on common vows. And here it is right here. Divorce is not an option. It won't be easy. But whatever God commands us to do, he gives us the power to do it. So trust the process. To God be the glory. Amen. Thank Amen. you for that blessing. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. 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 God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Brother Terry. Great job. God bless you. God bless you. Great job. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Brown. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. Man, I appreciate you blessing us today on this mess. I'm still trying to write some of this down, so give me just a second. <laughs> Nick and John gone on a carry on. I don't want to hold us up. I write slow. <laughs> but this is wonderful. This is wonderful information. Thank you, Doc. Mm -hmm. Bless you, man. Is it possible to see truth number one again? Shiara, can we go back to back number to one? one? Okay, sure. Mar marriage is about God and not you, I think. I'm not sure. Let's see. Truth number one is. There we go. Yeah, marriage is about God, not you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you, Reverend Brown. We were thoroughly blessed by your presentation. Um, we ought to learn how to stay together. And I appreciate you making this available for us. And 
uh, our staff has it. And so we will certainly have a copy of it. And I'm gonna put this in my repertoire. Uh, <laughs> as the old preacher say, somebody gonna see this again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man. And we're Too getting bad ready my to church gonna know where I got it from, Brown. <laughs> Too, too bad they already know where I got it from, but I don't they already care. know. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! All right, John. We've been blessed, and uh, we're certainly happy to uh, hear from our next presenter. Uh, I am very, very happy to hear from our next presenter. Our pastor have already introduced her. But I just got to say hello to her myself uh, because uh, her husband pledged me too. <laughs> her husband pledged my big brother and her, her husband also pledged me too. And we're just so excited and honored uh, for her to accept this invitation. And we're just so blessed by her presence, by her ministry, by the ministry of her uh, and uh, her husband and her son now uh, in ministry. And so uh, we know that uh, she is a love of Jesus Christ, a love of her family, a love of her church, a love of her sorority. But, uh, but at this time, without any further ado, let's hear from Ms. Cheryl Wesley. Thank you. We greet you all this evening in the precious and powerful name of Jesus the Christ. I'm so honored to have been asked to come and share. John, it's good to see you. Uh, it's good to see you as well, Pastor. It's been a long time. I had no idea you were watching that 1985 Cowboy Blue 280ZX. <laughs> but thank you for doing that. I want you to know that Pastor took it upon himself to take care of me going forward. Uh, he washed my cars for the most part <laughs> so the last few years and he got somebody else to do it. But thank you so much for even thinking of me uh, to come and share for a few moments this evening. I do have just a little handout because I'm a tactile person in case someone wants to write this down and then fill in the blanks. Um, and if you want the PowerPoint presentation, uh, Deacon Gilbert, I'll send that to you as well. So Ecclesiastes 3 opens with a familiar scripture, and uh, it reads, to everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up. How many times have you heard this scripture, and without any real emotional attachment or thought, you spontaneously replied, amen. Then it happened to you, to someone you love, to someone you've been accustomed to seeing, hearing, and touching. It happened to someone you built a family with, or you are a part of his family. It happened to someone you envisioned spending your golden years traveling with, or finally getting around to those special projects. Death invaded your space. It stopped you in your tracks. Death altered your life permanently. If you're a woman, your, your relational status has now changed from Mrs. to Miss, from married to widow. I remember in the weeks that followed my husband's transition, the need to get my home security checked. After walking throughout my home and property, the police officer encouraged me to also get my alarm system reactivated. You see, we seldom used it. And to be quite honest, I'd forgotten the code. I didn't worry about it because my husband knew it. So I didn't need it, right? When I contacted the company, the owner decided to come by and assess the unit because he said he lived close. He told me the updates that were needed and the cost to which I replied, okay, let's do it. He looked a little perplexed, he paused and then he asked, don't you wanna first speak with your husband before making the decision? After all, his name is what's on the contract. After taking a deep breath, I shared with him that my husband had recently passed. Of course, he responded by extending his condolences and what he said next moved me to tears. His, his statement was, my wife and I are gonna rush this order for you. We're gonna do everything within our power. And I will be back in two days to install the updates myself. He said, you need to get this done quickly because you're a widow. That was the first time I heard that title for me. 
I was a widow. The reality in that moment felt like a 32 story building collapsing on top of me. It took my breath away and opened a floodgate of tears that I had yet to experience. And there will be more to come. I think I'm sure if I were to take a poll of this group, each of you would be able to share a similar story of loss and of the realization that your spouse, your father, your husband, your friend, your cousin was gone and they weren't coming back. Routines have changed. Outings have changed. Friendships have changed. The way people perceive you has changed. And to be quite honest, you've changed. Death is personal. We all experience it differently. There are no cases exactly alike, although the results are the same. The one you loved, cared for, spent time with, and dreamt with is no longer here. And then with death comes grief. Grief, an emotion of loss. Grief happens. It's the natural progression that, belong, that begins the moment you experience the death of your spouse or your loved one. And for many of us, even before the physical transition. We've heard about the stages of grief and as a formal, former psychological counsel with the major police department way back in my twenties, I remember instructing people about grief and its stages. Stage one, denial. This is not really happening. I must be in a dream. Somebody's gonna wake me up. Denial. Stage two is anger. Anger with the person for leaving you, anger with yourself, and to be honest, anger with God. Why did you allow this to happen? Stage three is bargaining. If you allow him to stay a little longer, Lord, I promise I'll be better. If you don't take her from me right now, God, I promise I'll do things differently. Then there's stage four, depression. Now depression is different for everybody. Some of us have sleepless nights. Some sleep all the time. Some eat more and constantly. Others don't eat at all. Some want to be in isolation. Others just want to get in the car and go. Depression is different for every person contingent upon your temperament. And then stage five is acceptance, acceptance. It's real, it's happened. And then I'm, as I look through these stages now through a different lens, bargaining, that number three was never a part of my experience because I saw what was happening with my husband. So I didn't bargain with the Lord. But for those who are listening, is bargaining something that you've recognized? Is there one stage in this list that you may have skipped or one that you found yourself repeating? And I want you to know that it's normal to repeat a stage. Sometimes we're in denial and then we jump to acceptance and then we'll go to depression and then we'll go back to denial and then we get angry all over again. It's normal. It's a part of who we are. There's another stage that's not listed that could be a viable option. And that stage is guilt. Guilt that you could have done more or less. Guilt that that person is gone and you're left here to continue this life journey. I need to tell someone listening to me right now that you have to let the guilt go. You share it with the Lord in prayer and you lose it. Guilt will do nothing but destroy you. There are a couple of scriptures that I think about, one particularly that's 1 Peter 5 and 7. And it says, casting your cares upon him because he cares for you. You need to give that over to the Lord because he cares for you. And if in reality, you did something to that spouse, to that friend, to that brother that you didn't ask forgiveness for, go to the Lord. First John 1 and 9 says, if we confess our faith, sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. We need to be forgiven. We need to be cleansed so we can move forward in life, amen? So let go of the guilt. Now, those of us who remain have been given the opportunity to continue this journey. 
I realize that for some of you, this season is so fresh and it's so difficult that you may be asking the question, Cheryl, how in the world can I continue? The answer is simple. You breathe deeply and you take one step at a time. You breathe deeply and you take one step at a time. Step number one, we remember our love. We remember our love. Yes, you and your father, you and your husband, you and your wife, you and your friend loved one another. You had great days and then you experienced those other days, right? But those are memories embedded in your heart that will never be erased. But can I tell you about a greater love? of a love that's been present since the beginning and will be with you to the end. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God is the one who breathed into man the breath of life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 5 verses 8 and 9 says, for God commended his love toward you and that while we were yet sinners, he died for you. And then Romans 8, 38 and 39 says, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Remember your love. The lover of your soul is Jesus. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, today is a good day to accept him as Savior and Lord of your life. And if you're in Christ, you, but you're not as close as you know you need to be, today is a good day to reestablish a relationship, to grow in him, to learn of him, to love on him, to worship him, to praise him, to listen to him. He is the love of your soul and he is with you. Step number two is we remember our strength. We remember our strength. I can honestly tell you that there were days and moments when I had no clue how I was gonna put one foot in front of the other, but I had to keep moving. <laughs> my sons, although adults needed my strength, my grandchildren needed my energy, yet my mind was so overrun with the tasks that needed to be completed. You know, the business of death, contacting insurance companies, submitting documents, making appointments with banking representatives and fighting with them, changing car titles. What do I do with all of these clothes this man had? And the list goes on. But in those moments, the Holy Spirit reminded me of his word. Psalm 29 verses 10 through 11, the Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Psalm 18, 31 through 33, it is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. Psalm 28, 6 through 8, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy and with my song, I praise him. Isaiah 41, verses 9 through 11. So do not fear, I'm with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. The Lord is our strength. And two lessons I learned in that season was, number one, don't try to do everything immediately. And number two, extend grace to myself. I had to extend grace. And so I tell you, don't try to do everything all at once. Extend yourself some grace. Take your time completing the, uh, the, the task. There's no rush, no rush. 
Do it when it's time to do it. Do it when you feel like doing it. If you don't feel like doing it, back up off of it and step away. It's really okay. Amen. Step number three, we remember our companion. We remember our companion. We are never alone. We are never alone. I need you to say that to yourself. I'm never alone. One of my favorite chapters is John 14 with the Lord spending time with his disciples. It's filled with all kinds of words of encouragement and comfort because the Lord Jesus was telling them, I'm leaving. But in it, he says, I'm not going to leave you by yourself. In verse 16, he says, I will pray the father and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever because Jesus was leaving them. In verse 18, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. But look at verse 26 of John 14. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've told you. And then in verse 27, Jesus says, peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give to you. Not as the world give it, give out to you. But then he says, let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. The world and the situation and the circumstance will make us believe that the Lord has forgotten us. But the world is a liar. The Lord is with us in every moment, in every pain, in every situation, the Lord is there. And we have to know it. Even when we don't feel him, his word is sure. I will never leave you or forsake you is the word of truth. Step number four, we remember our hope. Again, in John 14, verses two and three, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I wouldn't have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare that place, I'm coming back to receive you unto myself. That where I am, you may be also. If your loved one loved Jesus, we have to believe that Jesus came back and got him just like he said in his word. Heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. He came back to receive them. That is our hope. John 17 and three says, and this is eternal life that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Titus one and two, in hope, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Romans 6 and 8. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Where we are is temporary. This is not our home. The Lord has a place prepared for us. And then Romans 14 and 8. If we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Having a relationship with Jesus Christ is the best solution for us. Meditating on his word, spending time in worship, reading the word, spending time in worship, fellowshipping with the saints is what we need in these seasons. It can be difficult, no lie. Um, I remember uh, on New Year's Eve, 2020. 2020, the first new year I would have without my husband. He died November 13, 2019. And I don't remember watching my service that year, to be quite honest. But the next year, no, it was the same year, 2020. So he died November 13th. And a few weeks later, we celebrated our wedding anniversary. And then watch night. So as we were preparing, I had some errands to run before watch night service. I made it to one store without incident. As I arrived to the parking lot of the next store, tears flowed uncontrollably. I was able to park and I just had a floodgate to open, just tears and tears, nothing sparked, it was just tears and tears. 
I had to call a girlfriend and say, pray for me. And she did in that moment. I stopped crying enough to go in the store, come back out. Made it home. Things were well. I started dinner, you know, doing those things. And all of a sudden, about 930, the same thing happened. But this time I was crying so hard and so ugly <laughs> at home that I had to text a friend. I couldn't even talk. And I just said, pray for me. Moments later, my sister responded with a prayer. And she opened by saying, Heavenly Father, I lift up to you, my sister Cheryl. And I sat there and I read and I cried and I read and I wiped my tears. It's the godly friends that you need in this season. They are the Lord's hand. They are the Lord's instrument that can usher you into his presence and that can intercede for you when you can't pray for yourself. Those are the type of friends that you need. Life on the other side of losing someone is different. But if you think about them and where they are, you realize that you're being selfish. <laughs> when you think about the glory that is theirs now and the fact that they are literally in the presence of the Lord, they would not want to come back here. I promise you, they wouldn't want to come back. So we glory that they are with the father who loves them. We glory that they were saved, that they were prepared. We glory in that. Um, in closing, I, 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 I'm going to date myself with this one, uh, but there was a song that was written years ago by Andre Crouch. And the words say, I've had many tears and sorrows. I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I didn't know right from wrong, but in every situation, God gave me blessed consolation that my trials come to only make me strong. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. And that is my hope for you, that you learn to depend on Jesus, that you have a relationship with him, that when the seas rock you, you won't be overtaken. Life happens, death happens, but then after death, there is eternal life with Jesus. So why downtrodden? Why are you discouraged? We can lift up our heads because the King of glory is here. The King of glory has come in. Yes, we miss our loved ones. Absolutely. There are times I would go in my home, John, I would use Deacon, I used to always say, honey, I'm back. And one time I went back and say, honey, I'm back. And I went, you're not even here. And I said, well, Lord, we're back home. And it's all right because he is our companion. He's our friend. He's our strength. He's our hope. And the Lord is the lover of our soul. I want to encourage you. Be, be of good courage. Trust God. Love God. Live for God. And when it's time for him to call you home, you'll be ready to. We thank you for the invitation to come. God bless you all that know there's joy in Jesus, even in grief. Amen. Amen. Amazing. God bless you. What a blessing. My God. God bless you. Thank you. Glory, man. Thank you so much. Bless you, Cheryl. You ministered to yes, me and our church and all of us right now, very appropriate for all of us. And yeah. God sent you to us tonight. We we'll just say thank you so much for allowing the Lord to use you. God bless you, brother. So much. I appreciate it. That was very helpful for me. Thank yes, you. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. That was Mama Gilbert.
Yeah, uh. beautiful Mama Gilbert. <laughs> yeah. I tell you, man, you have ministered to all of us, and even when we invited you, we just knew that the body of Christ needed to be ministered to in the area of grief, not mm -hmm. knowing at the time that uh, we would be dealing with grief in our own home, yeah. in our own mm -hmm. family, with the transition of my dad. Mm -hmm. you know, nothing but the Holy Spirit that allowed you to be able to be here for such a time as this. And Amen. Yes, God, death has invaded our space, but we remember the love. We remember our strength, our companion, our hope. Mm -hmm. We know where he is. We know where dad is. Yes, you do. We know where he is. He is. Yeah. yeah. We just, again, just want to tell you, thank you for letting the Lord use thank you, you Lord Jesus. Uh, on this evening. We give glory to God. Amen. I wrote Amen. down a many thank scriptures. You, I'll be you, going Lord. back, uh, reading all of those scriptures so that um, we recognize yes, the importance. Indeed. Dad always taught us the importance of standing on the word of God. Yes, sir promises of God. Yes, sir. I appreciate you leaving us all of those scriptures to remind us what he has tried to teach us all of our lives. <laughs> yes. It's the word of God that's going to keep you, man. Yeah. Because yeah. the Lord said that his word would never fade away. That's it. it. It's going to be here. So we stand on the foundation. Yes. yes. Yeah. The word of God keeps you. I'm, I'm a witness to that. Thank, Thank you again you. for the opportunity to come. Bless you. Bless you. Let's make this uh, available to whoever needs so many uh, are looking to get copies of this manuscript. Uh, and so we'll make this available between John and Shiara. We'll make sure I see some requests even in the chat uh, needing this information. And then we can always, this is recorded, uh, mm -hmm. we can always uh, get this whole lecture from our link that we'll make available as well. Amen. All right. Uh, I think we'll, at this time, we're in the hands of Brother Randy Leach um, to lead us at this moment. And then we'll be back in the hands of either Deacon John or Kathy Jordan. So I'll let y'all decide who will give us our final remarks for tonight. But let's receive Brother Randy Leach. Let me say I've been tremendous, tremendously blessed by all the presentations on tonight. Uh, so glad that we, you know, someone may be asking why you're dealing with grief during building healthy relationship because it's so relevant. Uh, I've never seen as much death as I've seen in the last two years. And so uh, and that's a reality. And, uh, and my brother, Terry Brown, boy, I tell you, when you talk about you get married to serve, not be served, it took me a long time to realize that, you know. And so I was thinking that's one of the benefits of getting married, having somebody to fix your plate and serve you. But I quickly learned that though it doesn't work. And Dr. Jamel Kemp, you're absolutely right. Love has everything to do with if you're going to have any kind of healthy relationship. Let me say I want to thank those personally on behalf of our pastor and church who answered the Macedonian call with your uh, financial support. As John Deacon Gilbert has mentioned, we haven't asked for any registration. Uh, we just trusted Lord because we just feel like if a church has better families, if there's better relationships, then we're going to be a better church and we're going to be a better people. If you've been blessed tonight, uh, you want to sow uh, into this conference, uh, we ask that you complete, please do so. Many of you always said last night we asked for $25, you know, and many of you responded. We want to say thank you. If you went on last night, uh, when able to give, we ask that you do so on tonight. And so let me just say a brief word of prayer and let you prepare to give. And we'll put it in the chat box. Uh, chat box, of course, you can text to give. You can go online to give. Uh, you can cash out. All those uh, things are available to you. Lord, we're just so grateful and so thankful 
for all of our presenters tonight. We thank you for their preparation. We thank you for taking their assignment seriously. Uh, Lord, you are so amazing because you know what we needed even before we did. And you have blessed our church these last two days for what we've heard in this Building Health Relationship Conference. And Lord, we've, uh, uh, we've been doing ministry long enough to know you always provide where you are guiding. We felt like you have guided this conference and we know you will provide the resources in order that the church will not suffer and will be a blessing to our presenters. So we thank you in advance for what you're going to do on the information that we've gathered in this last two days. Some marriages are gonna be better. Some relationships are gonna be stronger. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Let me see if uh, Cynthia would like to have a comment. Um, I know we've heard from me, you've heard from Kathy, we've heard from Dr. Sharon, but I want to give uh, Cynthia Gilbert an opportunity to uh, give a comment. Okay, good evening, everyone. First of all, giving honor to God, who is the head of our lives. I just want to thank each and every one of the speakers who have spoken tonight and last night, um, they have truly, truly blessed me and my family who have been on. Um, actually, 10 years ago today, Miss um, um, Wesley, I lost my husband today, 10 years ago. And so you have truly, I could really identify to everything that you have said. And you have, there is hope, there is hope because I am standing here today on God's promise and remember the memories that I have and the Lord has blessed me to be married again. So I just wanna thank you for sharing that with us because truly, truly you have blessed us. And I thank each and every one for their attendance um, this conference would not be anything without you, but do not just leave tonight without applying everything that we have heard, because 10 years ago was my first time going to this conference, and that's because I was broken and I did not want to go home. I just want to keep driving, and I drove to the conference, and I've been going ever since because I have applied what I've heard. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor, for giving us this opportunity. And it has truly, truly been a blessing. Thank you, Pastor. We're in your hands for the benediction. Let's hear from Mama. Let Mama, Mama say hello to everyone tonight. and. Thank everyone for being on. As you know, uh, mom and dad uh, started this relationship retreat, uh, relationship classes in our church. They were the original leaders of this class that we have at the Mountain Church. And um, uh, dad uh, turned it over later to Deacon John after some mentorship. He turned it over to Deacon John and uh, Dr. Sharon Gilbert uh, for taking leadership of this class. And so, but we got to hear from one of our uh, founding members who led uh, this class. Let's hear from mom tonight. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everybody. This has been one of the best um, meeting that we have had in the, the, every night has been just great. Everyone who was on program knocked the ball out the park. It was just, just been a blessing. And on the, this evening when she started talking about the, the grief and I took your advice 
that we have to you, grieve, but not without hope. And so I thank you so much for that. But this has been a great week, um, this um, Zoom. These days have been just really, everybody who was on program did knock the ball out the park. They did an excellent job. And I just wanna say thank you to everybody. All of the hard work, putting it together, all of the staff people who worked to put it together did an outstanding job. So thank you, I thank everybody for being on and those who did, was not able to get on, try to see if you can get, go back to your computer and pull it up again, <laughs> you would be blessed by hearing it. It's a way to, I know you all have all this technology, I'm not into technology, but if you was not on, and you heard of everybody talking about it, go back, pull it up, you will be blessed. So have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mama. Love you so much. Mm -hmm. Glad to love see you. you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Again, let us thank Dr. Kim, Dr. Mm -hmm. Terry Brown, and Sister Cheryl Wesley tonight. Uh, for blessing us richly. Give them a hug, a virtual hand clap or something. This whole group tonight knocked the ball out of the park. And uh, yeah. we just had a bunch of home runs tonight. Touched us on every level and certainly we were helped and blessed uh, tonight. Uh, I'm going to ask um, one of our uh, chef persons of our relationship retreat who partners with Dr. J uh, Sharon and John, uh, Kathy, will you give our closing prayer? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll come back and give the benediction for tonight. Mm -hmm. Amen. I was trying not to talk. I'm so full. Me too. Um, <laughs> I know we all are. And uh, just so happened, we the topics were planned prior yeah. to losing our Pastor E. So mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit is moving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Lord, we thank you, oh Heavenly Father, for what we've heard tonight. Mm -hmm. Lord, we thank you for this conference in total, Lord Jesus. We thank you for those speakers, oh Heavenly Father, for using them in a mighty way, oh Heavenly Father. Yes, Lord, Lord we just thank you for all of the words of encouragement that we've heard, all of the scriptures that we're going to apply, Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Lord, we ask that you just be, continue to be with our church, our mm -hmm. church families, the Gilbert family, oh Heavenly Father. Yes. Lord, build us up where we're torn down. Give us strength where we're weak, oh, Heavenly Father. Yes, Lord. Lord. We ask that you just continue to be with us and guide us, Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. We need your strength right now, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord, Lord, we ask that you just continue to give us what we need to put the next foot forward, oh, Heavenly Father. Yes, God. Lord, we love you and we praise your name, Lord, because you're worthy of all the honor and all the praise. Mm -hmm. Continue to be with our church, be with this ministry, and be with our pastor. In yes. Jesus' name, I ask and pray it all. Amen. 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 Love you, Mountain Church. Now may the grace of God and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with each and every one of you. Until that day, we shall meet again in Jesus' name. Amen. God 